good morning everybody online uh, and here in the building. It, it's an absolute delight to be physically uh, present with people and uh, in the church again to, to speak this morning. Simon Clift is my name. Uh, I'm part of the church family here. And as Helen said, we're, we're starting a, a, a series uh, on well-being from a Christian perspective. And we're going to spend a, a several weeks looking at what the Bible teaches us as the Bible tells us stories about men and women, ordinary men and women, and how they encounter God in the midst of the circumstances and the challenges of their life. And so this morning we're looking at, as we've seen, the story of Job. And I've called this talk, The Story of Job, Well-Being in the Eye of the Storm. The book of Job comes within the wisdom literature of the Bible. It's uh, often a, 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 we often overlook it. It uh, includes the Psalms and the book of Proverbs and the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes. And it uses poetry and story, but also a philosophical debate to open up a dialogue about some of the, the great mysteries in our life. Uh, and that's true. Uh, of the book of Job. It says, it, it asks this, what's going on when good people suffer? What does it tell us about God? And what can we learn about ourselves? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the scriptures that are inspired by you for teaching us. Help us uh, this morning. Speak to us. Uh, be gracious to us because uh, uh, these are challenging ideas and thoughts. Stretch our minds, illuminate our minds, and speak passionately to our hearts of your goodness and good purposes. Amen. So, we need to think about uh, the story of Job, and I'm going to try and do it in five minutes. Um, if, if, you, um, if you really want to find more about Job, look on the church website for more resources. This is a brilliant 12-minute um, summary, which is far better than what I can do. So, in the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. Uh, he came from east of the Jordan. Uh, he was a non-Jew. In fact, the word he uses for God is not the personal name Yahweh. So we know he wasn't a Jewish man. But he was great in the East. Uh, what we do know about him was, that, though, that he was a blameless and upright man. And that's something that the, uh, the book, the author, and God himself labors again and again. We need to hold that point. And as a consequence that he, of his being upright and good, God blesses him with prosperity, an expanding, expansive family, but also material prosperity. And in fact, we see uh, in chapter uh, 6 an extraordinary thing. We see the curtain being pulled back uh, into the heavenly realm. And we see God uh, having a daily briefing with his angels. Extraordinary story. And God is so proud of Job that he boasts of him to his angels. Can you see that in the... Um, um, Verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Uh, one of the angels who's called the Satan or, or, or the adversary um, says, hang on a minute. Isn't he just being faithful and praising you and worshiping you because of the good things that you give him? Take away those good things and see what's left of Job. One of the most striking things about this story is God's next words to Satan. Do you remember that from when Martin said, very well then, and then proceeds to give Satan the liberty to test Job, and as we see the, the sufferings that follow, an extraordinary statement in helping us understand God. But, as we read, as God says, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. There's a limit 
to what God allows uh, Job to go through. Then we see uh, Job suffering extraordinarily. Natural uh, disasters, uh, what the philosophers talk about being natural evil, but also um, moral evil in the form of the wickedness of the, of the raiding parties and of the, uh, uh, of the physical disease that Job is inflicted upon. The complete antithesis of well-being that we're meant to be talking about uh, this morning in our series. But in all these things, Job maintains his integrity and does not sin, the story goes. Those wonderful, well, we've even sung it as a song, didn't we? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the Lord's name be praised. And then when uh, Job's wife says, well, curse God. Look at what God is allowing to happen to you, Job. Job says, shall we not accept good from God uh, and not trouble? Well, 35 chapters follow with this lengthy philosophical debate. Uh, we haven't got time to go into it, but it's actually the meat of the whole book of Job. And it's wrestling with this idea of how can good people suffer? How can that be possible when God is good and all-powerful and all-knowing? Perhaps read the, the story of Job, the book of Job, from cover to cover in the week. or we'll get David Suchet to read it to you. God finally has his say uh, in uh, chapter 38. Martin's going to come and uh, read that to us now. Uh, uh, and uh, amazingly, God's response after these 35 chapters of dialogue is to put to Job 71, I've counted them, rhetorical questions to Job in which, with breathtaking, beautiful language, God displays his authority, power, and sovereignty over the entire universe. He talks about the stars in the solar system as well uh, as the cockerel, uh, the bear, the lion, and the wild donkey. And it's amazing. Do read chapter 38 to the end. But uh, Martin's going to take up the story um, a reading from chapter 40 as God reaches the climax of his words to Job. Uh, Job had uh, continued to uh, plead his innocence and called for his day in court uh, where he would wanted to put God in the dock. Well, Job did get his day in court, but it didn't turn out as he expected. Job, not God, was in the dock. And God, not Job, was the cross-examiner. And Job's testimony is strikingly brief, as Martin showed. It's as if in that uh, end of, in chapter 42, uh, I know that you can do all things, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Uh, and then he his, his words come to an end. It's as if he's saying, no further questions, Your Honor. The very end of the story, the, the epilogue, um, God vindicates Job. And actually he says, for all Job's raging and railing and saying, God, why, what's going on? Uh, even to the point where Job says, uh, I wish I hadn't even been born. God says of Job, you have said what is right. You have maintained your integrity. And the story ends with God vindicating him and restoring his fortune. In fact, twofold we see in, in the language of this epilogue. So what does the book of Job say to us? What does it say to us about well-being in the eye of the storm? And I, I hesitate as I come to think about some of the lessons to draw from it because I think even with our New Testament eyes and our understanding of Jesus and his death and resurrection, 
we see through the glass darkly when it comes to God's purposes through suffering. I also hesitate because I myself uh, am not in the eye of the storm. Um, But I'm aware of others who are. But I do think uh, the book of Job teaches us some profound things uh, that actually make a difference for all sorts of situations. Um, uh, You know, whether it is a a diagnosis of cancer or cancer treatment, Um, uh, whether it's chronic pain, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's things not turning out as we hoped they would. In fact, all sorts of situations that don't, don't tally with how we expect God to act in his world. Job speaks to us. And the biggest lesson of, of Job uh, is about suffering, and it's that suffering happens to good people. It's probably the most important lesson here. That, that suffering is not the sign of God's punishment on you. Uh, if, you're, if you're suffering in the eye of the storm, uh, with your pain, with your cancer, uh, whatever the particular situation, God is not turning his back on you. The book of Job teaches us that. He is not deserting us. In fact, the amazing thing, actually, God allows uh, Satan to test Job because he was upright, actually because he was a special one, Uh, so we can absolutely count on God being present with us in the midst of our suffering. The next thing is that suffering from the book of Job, we understand, is caused by evil. Uh, The Satan who's described there is not quite a fully kind of fleshed out version of the personified evil that we see through the rest of the scriptures. Uh, The New Testament talks about the the devil like a prowling lion seeking whom to destroy. Suffering is also the result of, of sin that taints and mars God's good creation. And yes, God does allow suffering God is is all-powerful and all-good. He allows suffering, but he sets a limit to it. Remember the the, the scene with the the curtain being rolled back at the beginning of, of, in that first chapter. Well, there is that reality even now, even when we we cannot see uh, the meaning, the purpose behind the suffering we're going through. uh, There is an understanding behind the curtain where things are clear. God sets a limit for suffering, and actually evil is limited. Satan reckons he has the upper hand, but his, his powers are limited, and he is a defeated foe. If we think through to the New Testament, the cross where Jesus died, uh, Satan thought was his greatest victory but proved to his, be his ultimate and resounding defeat. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And just listen to what the New Testament says when we try and grapple Uh, with trials and troubles and griefs. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And there's another verse in 1 Peter that we won't um, dwell on, but are equally profound when we're going through grief and trouble. My brother-in-law, Nigel, when I was telling him I was talking on this topic, said, he says we need to apply a 10-year rule to suffering. It might only start to make sense 10 years on after the suffering. I think he's right. We also learn things about God 
through the book of Job. We, 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 we learn that God is in his heaven. Psalm 115 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. The God of the scriptures, his wisdom is unsearchable. God is utterly consistent, infinitely good, all-powerful and all-knowing. He's in direct contrast to the pagan gods of Job's time and also, I think, to a modern parody of God that we sometimes adopt when we pray. It's a kind of weak and rather pathetic God. A God that says, it's awful, isn't it? I'm very sad and I'm desperately sorry for what's going on, but there's nothing I can do about it. That's not the God of the Bible. That's a parody of God. This next quote, uh, I'll leave it on the screen for you to read because it's, I think it, it, it's a statement for our time. It's from a book by Maurice Sinclair called Pathways of Wisdom that Paul uh, Thaxter lent me. The human self is not the center of the universe. We need to have our vision enlarged to include the majesty of the creator and his creation. We also need to be aware that although, although we don't, do not know the end from the beginning, God does. And of course, God doesn't stop there being majestic and sovereign. He entered our world of suffering. And Job does point to the, the ultimate innocent one, who suffers unfairly, the Lord Jesus, who was obedient even unto death, death on a cross. Don't let anyone suggest that God is heartless uh, and is anything but all good and all powerful. God uh, was lifted onto a cross to demonstrate those aspects. Lastly, what about ourselves and our well-being? Well, I, I think what Job teaches us is that we need a Job-style well-being. Uh, I spend a lot of my time in my week as a, a doctor uh, seeing pastors and, and church ministers and vicars um, who often are in situations like Job. And I need a well-being that makes sense even in difficult times. Uh, I need, I need a, an idea of well-being that, that makes sense on someone's deathbed or in the darkest uh, day. And that's what the well-being in the book of Job gives us. It actually comes by another name, and the other name is Integrity. The quality of being honest and having the strong moral principles that refuse to change, that continues to trust in the goodness of God, even when we can't understand what he's doing. My all-time favorite hymn uh, it was written, was translated from words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he wrote these words just on the eve of his own death, um, going back to the time of, of Nazi Germany. And these are the words that he wrote, which I think are awesome in their how profound they are. And something to claim hold of, uh, I will, if ever I am in the eye of the storm. And when the cup you give is filled to brimming with bitter suffering, hard to understand, we take it gladly, trusting though with trembling, out of so good and so beloved a hand. There's so much more to say from the book of Job. Uh, there will be some resources on the, the church website if you want to explore further, the podcasts, there's a, even a, a philosophical lecture that looks at evil and the goodness of God. Um, do, do, do read the whole book. It's an absolutely extraordinary book. We're going to spend a, a few minutes now re responding and, and a, uh, as we listen, perhaps sing along at home to a song that talks about it, uh, 
life being, it, it being well with our soul, uh, but in the midst of, of profound suffering and struggle. And it was recorded uh, a while ago within the, the church, and as you'll see, uh, some familiar faces singing. Um, so let, let's, let's ponder what, what God might be saying to us um, uh, through, these, uh, through, these, through this song. Amen.